There's been a huge shift in how we use chemotherapy in ER positive breast cancers over the past 25 years. From the time in 1999 when the NCI said every woman who had a one centimeter cancer needed chemotherapy to a time nowadays when we frequently can avoid chemotherapy for most ER positive breast cancers, but certainly those that are node negative and many of the ones that are node positive as well, because we understand that based on this genomic test, the chemotherapy is just not going to help them do better in the long run. So let's talk a little bit about the, the treatment, and we'll go back and do it through the lens of the staging. So a woman comes out of the definitive procedure, which again is going to be a lumpectomy with a sentinel node biopsy. The sentinel node is negative. They will not undergo a formal lymph node dissection. She will be told she had stage one breast cancer. Is she receiving effectively the same treatment as the DCIS woman where she's going to get radiation for local control. And then depending on the receptor status, she'll either get tamoxifen if it's ER positive, Herceptin if it's HER2 new positive. Is that, or is there any treatment beyond that? So the first thing to say is that's a very common problem. In uh, the United States, the most common presentation of breast cancer is of a stage one breast cancer found on a mammogram, which has a very good prognosis after surgery. But almost all patients will be candidates for some type of what we call adjunct adjuvant therapy. So adjuvant therapy are treatments that are designed to help print, prevent a recurrence after surgery. It's not unique to breast cancer. We use adjuvant therapy in colon cancer and in some sarcomas and in certain prostate cancers and in other kinds of uh, cancers as well. And sometimes patients ask, well, why do I need extra therapy after all the surgeon got rid of the tumor? It's a good question when you think about it. And the answer is that we worry about the possibility of microscopic disease that might be somewhere either in the breast or chest area or might have snuck away somewhere else in the body itself. And so we use additional therapies to mop up those microscopic bits of cancer. So one of those is the radiation therapy. We've talked about that. The majority of women who are 70 and younger and who are vigorous and healthy, uh, who have uh, early stage breast cancer are gonna be advised to get radiation therapy. Uh, many women in their 70s and even older will have to think about radiation treatment, depends on the type of cancer they have, their overall health status, and fundamentally, uh, you know, as a ballpark term, you might say whether they have a 10-year life expectancy or not, such that radiation is likely to be of some value to them in preventing recurrence over the next decade. And also, the vast majority of patients are going to be candidates for some form of drug therapy. And in terms of what has really changed the mortality from breast cancer, it's two fundamental things uh, beyond the surgery itself, which, be, uh, which is obviously the sine qua non. Um, one of them is early detection through mammography, and that's reduced the risk of breast cancer over the past 30, 40 years by about half mortality from breast cancer. And the other is effective systemic therapy. And that has given us the other half of improvements in mortality that we're seeing in the United States over the past you know, 30 years. And so for cancers of almost any size that are estrogen receptor positive, we think about anti-estrogen medicines like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. For tumors that are as small as a half a centimeter or more uh, in size, we think about drugs like trastuzumab that target HER2. And similarly, for very small triple negative breast cancers, we often think about chemotherapy. And then there's a discussion. Most women with HER2 positive cancers also get chemotherapy with that trastuzumab. And then as the tumor gets bigger and riskier, we amp up with more anti-HER2 drugs um, and more chemotherapy. If the tumor um, is estrogen receptor positive, we go through a process where we decide whether or not the patient needs chemotherapy, and that usually involves um, an Oncotype DX recurrence score or similar genomic test done on the tumor itself where they look at the patterns of gene expression in the tumor. And those studies have shown us that the majority of women who have low risk scores on this genomic test, and there's several commercially available, there's one called the recurrence score from uh, Exact Sciences, there's one called the MAMA print assay from Agendi, and there are others. Those have been shown to be very powerful at figuring out who does, and more importantly, who does not need chemotherapy. So there's been a huge shift in how we use chemotherapy in ER positive breast cancers over the past 25 years. From the time in 1999 when the NCI said every woman who had a one centimeter cancer needed chemotherapy to a time nowadays when we frequently can avoid chemotherapy for most ER positive breast cancers, certainly those that are node negative and many of the ones that are node positive as well because we understand that based on this genomic test, the chemotherapy is just not going to help them do better in the long run. Circle back, surgery is the sine qua non. Following the surgery, we use radiation therapy to sterilize the breast and chest area. 
And then the majority of women will need to think about some kind of drug treatment, which could be chemotherapy, antiestrogen therapy, targeted drugs, sometimes immunotherapy, to help prevent a recurrence anywhere else in the body. Um, how, just spend a moment there explaining to people the distinction between chemotherapy and some of these other therapies, because I think a lot of people sort of hear any systemic therapy is quote unquote chemotherapy, but you've, you've made a great point to distinguish between the anti-estrogen therapy and tamoxifen and astrozole, things like that. Uh, Herceptin, which is a targeted therapy right. versus quote unquote chemotherapy. So what, what are the things that you put in that bucket? How are you defining that? And, and specifically, what are some of the chemotherapies and what are their side effects? We've talked about the several different kinds of breast cancer. Nowadays, we have a different treatment paradigm, really, when it comes to the drug therapy for each of these different types of tumors. So for ear-positive HER2-negative breast cancer is the most common kind. The most important drug therapy relate to anti-estrogen medicines. So there are two basic flavors in the early stage. One is called tamoxifen. The other is called an aromatase inhibitor. These are each pills. They work by different mechanisms. Tamoxifen sort of blocks estrogen's ability to reach the estrogen receptor in the cancer cell. The aromatase inhibitors um, only work in postmenopausal women, uh, and they block the production of estrogen by non-ovarian tissue. So a postmenopausal woman still makes a little bit of estrogen in tissues like the liver, or the adrenal gland, the fat, and normal body stores of fat. And um, the aromatase inhibitors block that uh, production of estrogen. So the consequence is estrogen deprivation, which again sort of starves on the vine these cancer cells that we think depend on estrogen for their growth and development. So that's a, a very important medicine. And again, globally, hugely important, has saved more lives than bone marrow transplant or Gleevec or immunotherapy or whatever, you know, of the sexy new approaches in cancer, but the, the statistics are all in favor of these hormone manipulations as being globally of, of huge importance. Now, in addition to that, we also have a whole um, closet full of different types of drugs that we use. So some of them are traditional chemotherapy drugs, and patients may sort of have a uh, cultural sense of what these drugs are. They tend to be rather nasty uh, IV medicines. Uh, they make you sick to your stomach. They can make your hair fall out. They lower your blood counts. They make you tired. Uh, on the one hand, our supportive care in oncology has gotten vastly better in recent decades. So we have very powerful anti-nausea medicines. We have medicines to goose the white blood cells to come back faster so you're not at risk for infections. We have cold caps these days that allow women to often not experience hair loss during chemotherapy. So on the one hand, the, the supportive care has really transformed our ability to give chemotherapy drugs drugs such as doxorubicin, or what's also known as adriamycin, the red devil, uh, taxane-type drugs called paclitaxel or taxol, alkylator drugs like cyclophosphamide uh, or carboplatin, very widely used chemotherapy drugs. And maybe just for folks to understand how these things all have something in common, which is they're basically anti-proliferative drugs. As you said, Correct. they're old school, dirty drugs. These are drugs that have been around for many, many decades, and they target dividing cells. And that's, that's why right. and these side effects exist. Hair falls out because hair is dividing. You get sores in your mouth because the cells, the, the epithelial cells in your mouth are dividing. And so they're very nonspecific. Um, but, you know, on balance, they are sort of going after cancer cells in the sense that cancer cells are going to be dividing more frequently than non-cancer cells. That's exactly right. And so they're, they're rather blunt instruments, but sometimes it's really helpful to have a wrecking ball, if you will. That's where things stood, you know, for a long time. But in the past, again, two decades, we've really transformed how we think about this because of some newer drugs that have come along. So in the different subtypes, we have different approaches. Triple negative breast cancer had historically been one of the most difficult to treat uh, types of breast cancer where we didn't really have a targeted therapy. And so we used a lot of chemotherapy and there were dozens of trials optimizing chemotherapy and triple negative disease. But the biggest new thing has been immunotherapy. And I'm, I'm sure in other cancer podcasts, you've talked about the so-called checkpoint inhibitors, drugs like pembrolizumab and others that have proven very active in a lot of different tumor types. In breast cancer, the data are most compelling for these drugs in triple negative breast cancers, where we um, have shown that they can uh, reduce the risk of cancer recurrence. And interestingly, we usually use them 
before the surgery. We can come back to talking about that in what we call a neoadjuvant approach, which is the same idea as adjuvant therapy, drug therapy to mop up cancer everywhere in the body, but actually given before the surgery to shrink the tumor and to um, allow the patient to get the effective treatment that goes everywhere in the body. For the HER2 positive, the transformative event was the development of trastuzumab or Herceptin, which uh, the data came forward in 2005 for early stage breast cancer that adding Trastuzumab dramatically improved uh, the chances of never hearing from the cancer again, and that became totally standard for HER2-driven uh, breast cancers. Nowadays, for higher-risk ones, we add a second anti-HER2 drug called pertuzumab or Pergetta. Now, interestingly, we're still giving chemotherapy with those anti-HER2 drugs, but uh, we've completely flipped the outcomes for HER2-positive breast cancer, where it has gone from one of the most feared types of breast cancer to one of the most successfully treated types of breast cancer. And finally, with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, there have been two narratives. One has been a narrative about using less chemotherapy. So the good news is we are able to figure out a lot of women don't actually need chemotherapy for ER positive HER2 negative breast cancers. There's this genomic test we get to help us decide whether a chemotherapy is going to be valuable. And with that, about two thirds of the women who were previously offered chemotherapy can now avoid chemotherapy. Wow. At the same time, we're amping up some of the hormonal axis manipulation. So we are using um, ovarian suppression, uh, which means for younger women going into premature menopause to help prevent the cancer from coming back. We're using longer durations of anti-estrogens for higher risk tumors. And there's a very exciting new class of drugs called CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are oral medicines given for a couple of years now. They are targeted drugs that, again, slow down the proliferation of tumors. And for very high risk cancers, we're now looking at using them in addition to all the other kinds of medicines that we're talking about. So each type of breast cancer has its own paradigm of treatment, and each group is doing incrementally better and better because of those innovations. What are the indications for neoadjuvant therapy? So which tumors on imaging and biopsy are deemed cancers that where they're going to get all that systemic therapy before surgery? And my recollection is the, res the pathological response that you see to the neoadjuvant therapy is also a great prognostic indicator. That's exactly right. So for larger tumors, we have been moving more and more towards a paradigm of what we call neoadjuvant treatment, where the usual sequence of diagnosis of cancer, surgery, chemotherapy if you're going to get it, radiation therapy if you're going to get it, hormonal therapy out back. We're kind of moving it all around. And I often describe this as sort of a, a, a freight train. You know, it's, it's a cassette of treatment and we're just kind of giving the same kind of therapy, but we're switching the order. And we're switching the order for very specific reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that by giving the drug therapy first, we usually can shrink the tumor either in the breast or particularly in the lymph nodes as well. And so that means we can offer very good outcomes, the same good outcomes, but with less surgery. So women who might have needed a mastectomy might now be able to have a lumpectomy if the tumor shrinks. Or women who might have been obliged to undergo a so-called axillary lymph node dissection where all the lymph nodes in the armpit are removed, that carries a greater risk of limited restrictive, uh, limited range of motion in the arm or lymphedema in the arm, um, now might be a candidate for a sentinel node biopsy by shrinking those tumors ahead of time. So that's one big advantage of neoadjuvant therapy. It gives the same treatment, but it makes the surgeon um, able to do a lesser operation so there's less morbidity from the operation and a better cosmetic uh, result. The second big reason is that we learn while giving this neoadjuvant treatment how well the tumor responds. And if the cancer totally disappears, intuitively obvious, that's a really favorable prognostic finding. And we call that a pathologic complete response. It just means the pathologist looks under the microscope at the end of that treatment course at the time of the surgery and says, there's no cancer left. That's a really good finding and puts the patient into a much lower risk category, a much better prognostic group. Do those patients get adjuvant therapy or is therapy done? They often get something and we can, it depends again on the specific flavor of where you're at, but the prognosis goes way up. Conversely, if there's some residual cancer, it's, it's a less favorable prognostic finding, but in many instances, we actually have drugs that we're now using 
to overcome that residual disease. So for instance, in HER2 positive breast cancer, we give chemotherapy and trastuzumab up front. If there's residual disease out back, we can use a derivative of trastuzumab called trastuzumab emtansine, which improves the prognosis for those patients who have residual cancer. And there are many instances of this throughout the spectrum of breast cancer treatment. So we use neoadjuvant therapy for larger tumors to shrink the tumor in the breast, shrink the tumor burden in the lymph nodes, and to individualize or tailor treatment on the backside based on how much response there is. Let's talk about prostate cancer again as an analogy. So again, I think here's a great analogy, right? We know that in the case of prostate cancer, testosterone is not causing prostate cancer, but it's a growth factor for the cancer. So once a man has prostate cancer, if he has metastatic disease, androgen therapy is the standard of care, removing the androgen. If he has surgical disease, you remove the tumor, but men are able to go back on testosterone replacement therapy if they need it, provided the PSA stays low. Is there an analogy here in breast cancer where obviously if a woman has ER positive breast cancer and it's metastatic, well, you're going to have, you know, unfortunately you're going to be dealing with anti-estrogen therapy indefinitely. But if you're talking about a stage one cancer or a stage two cancer or even a stage three where you have a neoadjuvant treatment, you have a pathologic CR, as far as you're concerned, there's no evidence of disease. Are those women still uh, told to forego estrogen replacement therapy in, in postmenopause? And if so, why the difference from the biology of prostate cancer? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So as we've said a couple times in the course of the session, you know, the anti-estrogen medicines, which are very common, remember 80 plus percent of tumors are estrogen receptor positive, and nearly all those patients would be advised to have anti-estrogen medications. So the side effects all relate to the estrogen deprivation, hot flashes, night sweats, bone and joint stiffness and achiness, hair thinning, not hair loss, but thinning uh, finer hair, somewhat of a receding hairline, vaginal dryness and sexual health issues or frequent urinary tract infections related to changes in the epithelial of the genital tract, osteoporosis, all these things are related to the loss of estrogen. Now, the upside of the treatment is sufficiently important that we encourage patients to strongly consider those treatments nonetheless, but managing those side effects is a, is a part of the work of what oncology teams do. For women who've had complete pathologic response, one asks, do I really need all the therapy out back? And it's a great question. At the moment, we, we don't usually omit the antiestrogens if the tumor is ER positive. Parenthetically, it's rather rare for ER positive tumors to have that complete pathologic response because there's sort of an, an inverse relationship between the effectiveness of hormone treatment and the effectiveness of chemotherapy. The more hormone sensitive the tumor is, the less role there is for chemo and sort of vice versa in, in the space of ER positive disease. For women who have triple negative breast cancers, in theory, you could say, gosh, it would be okay to take antiestrogens, but we don't stylistically endorse that too often. I think what, what we really focus on is what's the, the symptom that we're trying to address with the hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. And in those instances, we have important conversations with patients. So for instance, patient has osteoporosis, we have very good non-hormonal options to treat osteoporosis. Patient has hot flashes and night sweats. There are non-hormonal options to address those. In fact, the FDA just approved a drug a few months ago uh, to try and treat hot flashes. Genital symptoms, uh, genital urinary symptoms, sexual health issues were actually rather liberal about using genital uh, preparations of um, estrogen, so vaginal estrogen creams and things like that that can alleviate some of the discomfort or other symptomatology without giving significant systemic absorption. For most breast cancer patients, we stay away from oral hormone replacement therapy, looking whenever possible to use non-hormonal or tapered or tailored hormonal manipulations that don't offer systemic exposure. Now, having said all that, everyone who sees a lot of breast cancer patients knows there's a few women who are really just so uncomfortable without the hormones that um, they really need that to have a valuable quality of life. And then you have a, you know, a unique conversation with the patient about those issues. Mm -hmm.